So this is the first time that I've kind of done a webinar using this particular software. So I'm using something called Zoom. Feels intuitively like this is a good product for us to be using. So this will be the first of many webinars that I actually do. In fact, this is probably how I'm going to conduct sort of even meetings and things like that. So definitely going to get into this more and more. But specifically today, what we're talking about is macronutrients and food tracking. So again, I this is the first time I've done a webinar. I've actually prepared some notes just so I can kind of stay on track with the things that I want to talk about. So I'm going to talk for a bit first and then ultimately we'll get into some questions. So I think really first of, first and foremost, um, if we kind of start digging into why understanding macronutrients is so important and to do that, we need to look at perhaps the struggles of the, of the modern dieting world. So if you look over the last, say, 30 years, all of the diets that have hit the market, so low-fat diets, low-calorie diets, the Atkins diet, the paleo diet, the ketogenic diets, all of these diets and dietary trends, if you like, they all have things in common. And the things that they have in common are generally that they become void of a particular macronutrient. So for example, you know, low fat diets, classically these were the earliest diets that kind of hit the mainstream market, were low in fat. Paleo diets and the Atkins diets, those kind of diets, they're all deficient in carbohydrates. They're all focused on proteins and fats and so on and so forth. The ketogenic diet, predominantly fat, small amount of protein, barely any carbohydrates. So all of these modern diets that hit the market, they're all actually very focused on the very topic of this conversation, which is macronutrients, because carbohydrates, proteins, and fats are macronutrients. And what happens in, when you start encountering dietary trends, they try and focus their belief systems, if you like, on what they claim to be the most important macros. And so we as being users or as people that are engaged in the dieting world, we become focused on this concept that one or two macronutrients are better than others. And the fact is this is simply not the case. So as somebody like me who is really, really focused on ensuring that you all get great results in your weight loss journey or in your muscle build journey or in your get fit journey, everything that I do is all about eliminating risk. So it's eliminating the chances that you aren't going to be able to achieve the results that you want to achieve. Some people get results really quickly when it comes to weight loss. Other people, it's not quite as fast and it's a little bit more of a trial and error process where we can you know, take the basics of genetics and implement it. But there are always points that we have to sort of, you know, test out. So it might be, you know, numbers of, number of calories and things like that. So everything with me is all about mitigating the risk of failure. And that's why the right education around macronutrients, how to track your macronutrients and how to use them effectively is so important. So I'm going to kind of premise this talk with the concept that all macros are important. Carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, you need them all. And so going forward now, it's going to be about the benefits of all of these particular macronutrients, what they are, and why they are all so important. So first and foremost, what are macros? So as we've said, when we talk about macros, the world will tell you that there's three macronutrients, carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. There is actually a fourth macronutrient, and that's alcohol. So carbohydrates, proteins, fats, and alcohol. So there's actually four macronutrients. And what I want to do is just talk about the importance of each of them. So if we think about carbohydrates, you'll all know what carbohydrates are. You're, there's so many kind of words and terms that you'll have heard around you know, what a carbohydrate is. You might hear things like simple carbohydrates and complex carbohydrates. So a simple carbohydrate would be, for example, something that breaks down, breaks down really fast. So something like plain sugar or fruit sugars. 
And you might also hear refined and processed. So that just refers to the process by which, or the, the manufacturing process by which the sugars are created. So refined sugars and, you know, refined rice and things like that. And then the other type of carbohydrate is complex carbohydrates. So these are carbohydrates that, or these are foods that contain carbohydrates that are made up of many molecules and they require a little bit more processing to break them down. Now, a gram of carbohydrates releases a certain amount of energy and carbohydrates have many important functions in the human body. And I'm going to say that the two most important functions of carbohydrates from the perspective of what we're thinking about here, which is body composition and weight loss, the most important functions are, number one, they provide you with energy. Actually, we'll say three functions. Number one, they provide you with energy. Number one, they allow the storage of energy. And number three, they allow you to go to the toilet properly and open your bowels properly, so they help improve your digestive system. Now, carbohydrates get broken down in two different places. Number one, they get broken down when you chew. So when you put food in your mouth and chew, your, uh, the glands in your mouth secrete enzymes that start to break down carbohydrates. And also, carbohydrates get broken down in your small intestine. So that's two very, very important things to think about, and we're going to start talking about that more a little bit later on. The next macronutrient is protein. And protein is composed of smaller units called amino acids. And I'm sure you're probably familiar with amino acids because they get talked about so much now in the general fitness world and in the general market. But proteins are made of amino acids. And there are nine essential amino acids that we have to consume in our diet. So when people talk about, you know, people will say that you have to eat certain foods or we have to eat combinations of certain foods to get all of the essential amino acids. Well, we need all the essential, essential amino acids for all of the processes in our body, including muscle repair, you know, and, and, you know, maintaining skin structure, hair and all those sorts of things. Now, protein gets broken down in your stomach and to a degree, it also gets broken down in your small intestine as well. So when you chew or when you consume protein, for example, meat, you chew it, you swallow it, it goes into your stomach and there's enzymes that then start to break the, pro start to break the protein down. Uh, and then there's also a small amount of um, digestion that also happens from the food in the small intestine as well. Again, something else that's very important to remember. The third macronutrient is fat. And there are lots of different types of fats. The ones that we're just going to focus on for now are the sat are saturated fats, which predominantly come from animal sources, but they can also come from things like coconut oil. Monounsaturated fats, and these are fats that come from things like avocado, certain types of oils, almonds, and other, other types of nuts. And then there are the polyunsaturated fats, and the polyunsaturated fats are actually composed of two different types of fats, omega-3 and omega-6. And I'm sure you're going to have heard of these because omega-3 omega fats classically come from things like fatty fishes, um, fatty fishes come from fatty fish, so things like salmon, um, mackerel, those kind of food products, but you can also get it from plant sources as well. And the omega-6 fats tend to come from certain plant sources, certain nuts and things like that. Fats predominantly get uh, broken down or they get digested, if you like, in your small intestine. And it's your gallbladder that releases bile. And it's the bile that helps emulsify, emulsify fats. And then ultimately, they get absorbed into your system. So, and then the, the, the fourth one, which we will just mention, is alcohol. So, carbohydrates and protein they release about four calories of energy per gram. So when we talk about calories, what a calorie actually is, is it's essentially the amount of heat that gets released. So, and heat is energy. So a gram of carbohydrates and a gram of protein release four calories of energy or four calories of heat. A gram of fat releases nine calories of heat. 
and a gram of alcohol releases seven calories of heat. So it's actually, in terms of calories, it's quite, a gram of alcohol is quite close to the same calorie, well, almost the same number of calories as fats. And that's incredibly important to know. So we've just, co we've just covered off quite a lot of stuff there um, in a short space of time about what the macronutrients are, how we digest the macronutrients. And actually, perhaps I should mention, so I mentioned why carbohydrates are important. Protein is obviously important for things like muscle repair and muscle repair and recovery and other kind of structural components to the body. Hormones um, and fats are important for maintaining hormone health, uh, the integrity of cell membranes, and lots of other lots of other good stuff like that. So let's get on to calories because we can't talk about macros and tracking if we actually don't have a good understanding of calories. So. Oh, so I'm sorry, Grace. So uh, it says the connection is breaking up. Can you all just let me know if you can hear me okay? So if you could all just uh, all just go in the chat section and if you could just leave a message and just say yes or no, if you can hear me okay? Before I carry on. Thanks, Bethany. Thanks, Maria. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Robin. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thanks, Sue. Okay, so I think we're, I think we're, uh, Leslie sounds good. Thanks, Leslie. Awesome. Okay, so let's get on to calories because this is where it gets, this is where it's kind of, uh, this is like the, the prelude to uh, macronutrients because, because, uh, you know, you can't even play with macros unless you know your calories. Um, hey, Tori, thank you so much. So, the human body has or requires a certain amount of energy to function on a daily basis. And this generally gets referred to as your resting metabolic rate. So it's the number of calories that you need just to function on a daily basis. And this is really, really important to know because if you think about it, if you're, if you're completely inactive, then when you're completely inactive, that's essentially your resting metabolic rate. So if you only consume enough calories to cover your basal metabolic rate or your resting metabolic rate, any activity you do means you're essentially exceeding the number of calories that you've consumed and therefore automatically you're in a calorie deficit just based on a minimal amount of activity. So it's really important to actually pay attention to the number of calories that you consume. There are lots of calculations. There are lots of tools, apps that will tell you how many calories you should be consuming. But I'm going to tell you the, the most important thing when it comes to calories that you need to understand. You need to know how many calories you can consume without losing weight and without putting on weight. That's the most important calorie number that you should know. How many calories can you consume on a daily basis without putting weight on and without losing weight? Because if you know what that number is, then that, you know, coupled with your activity, then that essentially represents your maintenance calories. So let's say you wanted to build muscle, well then you'd have to make sure that you're consuming over maintenance calories. And let's say that you wanted to lose body fat, you'd have to make sure that you're consuming below maintenance calories. So we can get as technical and as fancy as we want, but ultimately there is a number that represents your maintenance number of calories. And when you know that number, that's when the magic happens. So assuming now that we know your maintenance calories, and let's assume that your goal is losing weight, and we want to start thinking now about tracking macros. So you'll all know from your fitness genes results that we give you a guide about how many calories you should consume as a, as a starting point to start thinking about, you know, your calorie numbers, because at the end of the day, that that's a predictive tool. It's impossible, absolutely impossible to complete, to accurately know how many calories you should consume without spending a week or two at a certain calorie level and seeing what happens to your body weight or your body fat. But let's assume that we know what your calories are. Based on your fitness genes results and based on your goals, 
we tell you what your ratios of carbohydrates and proteins and fats should be. And let's just jump into that just for a second. So with regards to carbohydrates, the sorts of things that we consider are the genes that give us an indication about whether or not you're efficient at switching from burning carbohydrates to burning fat. So if you're somebody that can switch from burning carbs to burning fats easily, then following a low carbohydrate diet isn't required because you don't have any inefficient st steps of switching between burning carbs and fats. So you don't need to follow a low, a low carbohydrate diet. But if you're somebody that does have an issue with switching from burning carbohydrates to burning fats, well then you would need to reduce the carbohydrates in your diet in order to promote fat burning. And one of the genes, for example, that we look at there is the PPAR gene, PPAR alpha. Because PPAR alpha represents the efficiency, or it's one of the genes that represents the efficiency of that step. Something else which we have to consider as well when it comes to carbohydrates is the FTO gene. So when you have the variant of the FTO gene, if you remove carbohydrates from your diet, because of the behavioral elements that comprise the effects of having the variant of the FTO gene, it means you're not able to stick to an eating plan that's, de that's devoid of or that's void of carbohydrates. So another reason why we have to, we have to use that piece of information when we start thinking about constructing what your carbohydrate ratio sh should look like, as well as you know, many other things, insulin sensitivity, carbohydrate sensitivity, and things like that. With regards to protein, one of the most important things with protein is that when you, so when people have issues with say hunger or they carry the FTA gene variant, then protein becomes incredibly important as a tool to manage hunger. But also where you have a lot of body fat to, to lose, a lot of early morning protein is something that seems to drive energy expenditure through the early portion of the day so it can actually promote fat burning. So on the basis you're and on the basis you're exercising and we know the minimum amount of protein you should be consuming, if it's also a case of burning body fat, then we would gradually increase your early morning protein as well because of the relative contributions that that would make. And the third one is fats. And the fats is incredibly interesting because we can use genes like the APO2 gene and the APO5 gene and the FTO gene uh, and a couple of other genes where we can start thinking about overall ratios of, well, first of all, the overall macronutrient ratio of fats in general, but then breaking down saturated, polyunsaturated, monounsaturated fats into the right ratios that's going to drive your ability to lose body fat and also achieve your body composition related goals by hormonal optimization and all of these kind of strategies. So let's now, if, in fact, if we take meat as an example, so I'm currently following the muscle build, the, the brand new fitness genes muscle build program for the brand new fitness genes muscle build plan. We have a group of guys, we're all doing the challenge. It's, uh, it's a pretty phenomenal challenge, actually. The workouts are amazing. The community is awesome. In fact, one of the guys on the call at the moment, Tori, he's actually uh, doing the muscle build challenge as well at the moment. But ultimately, what's important is understanding what my, macro, what my calories should be, what my macronutrient ratios should be, and then how do I stick to those macronutrient ratios. So I'm currently consuming around about 2,200 calories a day. I'm around about 40% carbohydrates, about 30% protein, and about 30% fats. And in this ratio, with that number of calories, that's enabling me to build muscle tissue um, without putting on body fat. So it's essentially like a, a lean bulk, if you like. Now, the way that I ultimately track these calories or track these macronutrients and there's, there's kind of there's two things that you can do number one you can use a product like my fitness pal so when you pay for the premium version of my fitness pal it enables you to enter in what you want your macronutrient ratios to be and then you can obviously track against them because when i use my fitness pal i put in there that i want to be consuming 2200 calories in the ratio of 40% carbs, 30% protein, and 30% fats, and then the number of meals that I want to consume in order to do that. For me, it's three meals a day. 
Um, but I'm going to talk about something that sometimes makes it more than three meals a day. But let's, for, for the time being, assume that it's three meals a day. So that's three meals a day of approximately 700 calories. So each meal I eat is around about 700 calories. And that ultimately means that let's just for argument's sake say that about 300 calories is going to come from um, carbohydrates, about oh, slightly less than that, um, about, about 200 calories is going to come from protein and about 200 calories is going to come from fats. Let's just say for argument's sake, that's what it is. So ultimately when I'm tracking, they're the numbers that I'm looking to achieve. And then you divide that then into grams. So for my 300 calories of for my 300 calories of carbohydrates, I'm then going to divide that by four, which is going to give me around about 75 around about 75 grams of carbs. For my 200 calories of protein, is going to uh, divide that by four as well. So that's going to give me 50 grams of protein, and then my fats. You have to divide the fats by nine. So my 200 calories of fats divided by nine is going to give me around about 21, 22 grams of fat. So a typical meal for me is about 70-ish grams of carbs, 50-ish grams of protein, and about 20-ish grams of fats. Three times a day, that enables me to meet my macronutrient ratios, and it also enables me to meet my calorie intake. And then when I use my fitness pal to track that each time I eat a meal I enter in the foods that I'm eating it automatically does the calculations and then it tells me exactly where I am through the day relative to my targets so sometimes it might be that I get to the end of the day and I haven't quite met my targets it might be that I've got 10 grams of protein left over five grams of carbohydrates left over and 10 grams of fats and the trick there is not to ignore that so if I get to the end of the day and I have that much left over, then what I'll do is I will create some sort of mixture of foods and have that as a late night snack in order to ensure that I meet my overall daily calorie target. Because if I don't, then I'm going to reduce the chances of me being able to reach my goals, uh, which at the moment is building muscle. So um, that's kind of all well and good. But we need to now start thinking about how do you actually achieve those macronutrient targets or how do you achieve those macronutrient ratios? So there's something very simple that I do, that I do for that. I generally, generally speaking, how I look at food on a daily basis is I consider food to be something that's functional and it's required for me to achieve, do the things I do and achieve the things that I need to achieve. I am generally an incredibly busy person I have to get up very early, I have long working hours, and I have a lot that I have to cram into my day. And the foods I eat, first of all, provide me with energy to get through the day, but also, you know, as I've just described, the foods I'm consuming, I'm consuming as a requirement to help me achieve my goals. So it's, it's incredibly important for me to ensure that I'm consuming the right types of foods. So 80% 80, 80 of my week, I'm not that concerned about, you know, how delicious foods are or, you know, um, all of that sort of stuff. I'm just focused on making sure I get the right foods in my diet to enable myself to function how I want to function. Alert, awake, energized, energy to train, feeling good, lean, all of these things are incredibly important to me. So what I do is I take protein, carbohydrates and fats and I just add a list to each of these of the, of the foods that are important for these particular components. So let me explain. When I think about protein, now I follow predominantly a vegetarian, a veg, predominantly vegetarian diet, but for the sake of simplicity, I'm not going to talk about the vegetarian status of this because I think it's important to start off with to consider this in its simplest form just by the way we separate foods out. So if you think about protein, if you think of white fish, white meat, whey protein, and something like cottage cheese, those four things are predominantly protein. From the perspective of macronutrients, 
from those four things, all I consider them counting towards is protein. Don't think about carbohydrates, don't think about fats, they just count as protein. If you consider things like red meat or salmon, then these are not only protein, but they are also fats. So when you consider those particular components, when you consider those particular food items, you also need to consider the fat proportion of them as well. When you start to think about foods like chickpeas, beans, lentils, tofu, and other vegetarian sources of proteins or plant-based sources of proteins, you also need to consider carbohydrates when you consider them in terms of their macronutrients. If we think about just carbohydrates, then if you consider rice, sweet potato, oats, pasta, quinoa, as being the main sort of carbohydrate sources, when it comes to macronutrient ratios, I only consider them as carbohydrates. I don't worry about protein or I don't worry about fats from them, I just think about them as carbohydrates. In terms of vegetables, and kind of things you might put into salads. Generally speaking, um, I don't worry too much about their relative contribution to carbohydrates. If I have lots of vegetables, I might say that it represents maybe five grams of carbohydrates max, but when it's predominantly fiber, I don't worry too much. So I've given you so far what I consider to be a list of proteins and not worry about anything else. What I consider to be a list of carbohydrates and not worry about anything else. And then the final thing is fats. So when we talk about fats, we're talking about oils, we might be talking about nuts and seeds, we might be talking about nut butters, we might be talking about things like avocados, uh, maybe coconut oil, things like that. And they're just predominantly sources of fats. So we don't worry about protein, we don't worry about carbohydrates, we just think about fats. So let's say that I wanted to create a meal that was 50 grams of protein, that was 70 grams of carbohydrates, and that was 20 grams of fat. What I could do is I could take, say, say eight, ounce, eight ounces of white fish, which would give me my protein. I could then take, say, I don't know, seven ounces of sweet potato that would give me my carbohydrates. And I could then take, say, two tablespoons of, in fact, no, it would be one tablespoon of olive oil drizzled onto that food, and that would give me my fats. So where I'm trying to create a meal that is balanced in the macronutrients that I require, I can just simply take white fish, sweet potato, and oil, and then get, get those into the right quantities that means I'm gonna meet my macronutrient ratios. And I can then add you know, lots of vegetables to that as well. But in its simplest form, that's how you would achieve a macro compliant meal. Now let's say for example, I wanted to have salmon. Well, let's say that I had, you know, let's say that I had you know, four ounces of salmon, something like that, which you know, I think is about 20, 25 grams of protein. But that would also contain about 15 grams of fat. So if I have that much salmon, then it's gonna give me 25 grams of protein, it's gonna give me 15 grams of fat, so that means I've only got another five grams of fat that I can eat in the meal. I need to find about another 20 grams of protein and I need to add my carbohydrates in. So it might be, that if I'm looking for 50 grams of protein, what I might say is have salmon, which let's say four ounces of salmon, and then maybe some scallops or maybe some prawns or um, shrimp or something like that, which would then top up my protein. I've then got my salmon, which my salmon's giving me about 15 grams of fat. And I would then add my carbohydrates to that, which might be some rice or something like that. And then, so overall in that meal, that's how I've managed to get my, uh, the right number of carbohydrates, the right number of fat and the right amount of protein in that meal based on my macros or based on the macros that I require. Now, let's say that I go through the day and I eat my three meals and I achieve my 70 grams of carbs, my 50 grams of protein, or, and my 20 grams of fat. Let's say I go through the day, and, sorry, let's say I go through the day and I achieve that in two meals. But then let's say there's one meal where I only get half of that. So let's say 
let's say for my evening meal, maybe I've gone around to a friend's house and all I get is 25 grams of protein, 30 grams of carbs and 10 grams of fat. It means that I'm going to get to the end of the day and I'm going to be 25 grams of protein short, 35 grams of carbohydrate short and 10 grams of fat short. So what do you do? Well, you don't ignore it. That's the first thing. Because what I'm saying is that when you know your calories, when you know your macros, your eating becomes functional towards your goal. And I want to do everything I can do to build muscle, lose body fat, and make sure I'm as efficient as possible, make sure I recover, make sure I sleep well. So I get to the end of the day, and I'm at home, and you know I'm just about to go to bed, realize I've got all these macros left over. What do you do? And this is where it's a really good idea to start thinking about some macro-friendly buffers, if you like, or some foods that you keep in your house that will enable you to, to basically meet your macronutrient goals. So this is what I do. I always make sure that I've got some yogurt in the house. So if I'm in the UK, it's total yogurt. If I'm in the States, it's phage yogurt or skia or any of these yogurts, which are essentially mainly protein and a very small amount of carbohydrates and barely any fat. So what I will typically do is if I'm trying to achieve, say, 10 grams, if, if I'm trying to achieve 25 grams of protein, then what I might do is take, say, 150 grams of phage yogurt and then a scoop of chocolate protein. So at the moment, I use Garden of Life protein. So a scoop of chocolate Garden of Life protein, mix all that together, and that gets me to my 25 grams of protein. And then for carbohydrates, if I'm looking, for, let's say, you know, I'm looking for 30 grams of carbohydrates, I might throw a banana in. So I'm then going to then mix all that together. So I've got a mixture now of yogurt, chocolate protein, and banana. And then I'm looking for another 10 grams of fat. So I might throw in, say, half, say um, half a tablespoon of almond butter. Mix it all together. Maybe a little bit of cinnamon on there as well. And sit down and enjoy it. And that's a really easy way that from those leftover macros that, that but yeah, from the macros I've got left over, I can then consume foods that mean I meet my daily targets and therefore I'm doing everything I can to achieve my goals. So I would, and obviously that comes from tracking my macros using something like my fitness pal and just being as accurate as possible and mitigating my chances of failing to reach my goals because I'm doing everything I can to meet my functional calorie requirements or my macronutrient needs. Now, the balance here is being obsessive because when it comes to dieting and when it comes to food you know something really bad that's happened over the last 30 years is the obsessive that is how people have become incredibly obsessed with with diet uh, and obsessed with body image and all these sorts of things so it's really important to understand that what we're not we're not trying to create obsessive behaviors here we're trying to create behaviors that enable you to achieve your goals regardless of irrespective of what those goals are but so there's always a balance of you know going around with your phone and you know tracking your calories and punching everything in there's always that balance of where where that becomes obsessive and where it becomes just something that you can do just to try and keep yourself accountable so i for example i i don't the way I go about my day is I'll normally have my breakfast and then record what I've had for breakfast, not while I'm eating breakfast, but at some point in the morning. I then I don't normally, um, I'll then have my lunch. I won't normally track my lunch. I'll have my evening meal and then it'll be later on in the evening that I then add what I had for lunch and I add what, add what I had for dinner into my fitness pal. And then I'll see what I've got left over. So again, really doing everything I can not to, um, really doing everything I can not to um, kind of get too obsessive. I can just see that Maria has put her hand up. So I think Maria's got a question. So uh, please go ahead, Maria, what's your question? Oh, no question. 
Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. I saw that. I saw that little hand go up, and I thought it. I thought it was a question. Uh, there is actually a question. Actually, it's um, and the question is from an anonymous attendee, and the question is: I am trying to lose weight. Well, actually, before I answer this question, so so in fact, because in fact, this, this this draws us to a good finish where we can start the Q and A. So so ultimately, I don't try and be obsessive in terms of my behaviours through the day. But I, I use my fitness pal as a tool. And in fact, where I am now, I would say that probably I, I probably only track about probably three or four times through the week. And that's simply because the meals that I consume, because I'm, because, because I'm so used to doing this, I know exactly what the macronutrient ratios are and the numbers and what the numbers in there are. So I tend not to track them just where it's consistent. When I've been inconsistent, I, I've eaten a smaller meal, eaten something I don't normally eat, that's when I'll track and that's when I'll get to the end of the day and see what I've got left over. So, so that's a sort of a, um, a, um, a rough guide or a quick sort of you know, look at what are calories, what are macros, why are they all important, how do you track. Um, I mean, I guess the one thing I would say is that where things like my fitness pal are incredibly useful is let's say that you do go out or let's say you go to a supermarket and you, and you buy particular food items, you can just scan them into my fitness pal and it will tell you exactly, you know, the calories that are in them, the macronutrient ratios that are in them. And that can actually be incredibly helpful. So I think what we'll do is let's, let's, let's launch into the, into a Q and a, I think there's like a Q and a button where you can actually ask a question. And there is one question in there so far. So, um, and I think it says answer live. He would like to answer this question live. Yeah. Okay. So I am trying to lose weight, but when I eat only maintenance calories, I feel extra hungry. What can I do not to overeat, but lose weight? So this question is all to do with managing hunger. And there are a number of strategies that you can use to manage hunger. Number one, if it's between meals and you are feeling hungry, drink a load of cold water. Cold water is absolutely brilliant for uh, controlling hunger you can also try things like cold tea as well cold tea or even if you're allowing if your genetics and if your daily allowance allows you you could also try consuming black coffee again very good at controlling appetites one of the other kind of tried and tested tricks is in your fridge or in your workplace have a big tupperware dish full of uncooked vegetables so that you can just munch on raw vegetables through the day as well again very good for controlling hunger and you can also potentially do things like put some cayenne pepper on there or if you like sweets you know cinnamon and things like that it can all uh, it, that can all be very good at controlling appetites the other thing as well if you want to go a little bit more elaborate is mix five grams of glutamine with cold water because glutamine is something else that's really good for managing appetite as well because of its effects on the digestive system okay sue what about good versus bad calories, good fats versus bad fats? Should this be monitored? Sue, so, so if you look at your fitness genes results, and if you look at your APO2 and your APO5 genes, it will tell you how much polyunsaturated and saturated fats you should consume. What I would say is if you if you're focus on minimizing saturated fat intake, and then just look at what other fats you should be increasing. If it's monounsaturated fats, just boost things like avocado, olive oil, almonds. If it's omega threes, then you know potentially either use a fish oil supplement or in, increase your intake of things like fatty fish, like salmon, mackerel, um, those kinds of things. But you should definitely track. You should definitely be tracking your fats because it will keep you accountable and it will just enable you to um, it may, it enable you further to uh, manage your diet. Uh, good calories versus bad calories. Well, all calories are the same because they're just measures of energy. In terms of foods, I think perhaps what you might be asking is, let's say, proce processed foods versus clean whole foods. What I would say there is that if you're, if the problem with processed foods, if that's what we're referring to here, is they contain a lot of ingredients that can damage your gut bacteria. So it's not the calorie value that's important. It's actually other things that are contained within the food item that are important. So keep your processed food consumption to a minimum. Maximize your consumption of whole foods. And yes, definitely track this. 
because it can have an effect on digestive health. Aaron, how are you, buddy? Uh, we have a question from you, which is, what are your thoughts on ashwagandha? Well, my thoughts on ashwagandha. It has been used for some time uh, it, as a as kind of in sort of herbal medicinal type purposes. It potentially can help reduce things like anxiety. There might be some effects on you know stress levels like uh, cortisol and things like that. Possibly some potential benefits uh, with testosterone. Um, so it depends on what your reason is for wanting to use it, but. Um, the, its main uses are, oh, and the other thing is that it's an adaptogen as well, but its main uses are for, uh, for anxiety and stuff like that. So if that's why you're using it, then it could be effective, it could be useful, but I'd really want to know what your reasons for using it actually are. Okay, Robin, any tips on consistency and motivation? I find it difficult to keep to my macros and meal plans and slip to convenience foods and takeaways. Once I slip, it tends to go from a cheat meal to a cheat week to a cheat month. Robin, that is a very, very common thing uh, to happen. And there is no, there's no easy answer to this. There is no easy answer to this. It's all to do with preparation and keeping yourself accountable. So preparation. I always make sure, always, always, always make sure that I have certain foods that are always available to me to prevent my chances of, you know, for want of a better word, failing in my pursuit of the best eating plan. What do I mean by that? I also, I always have lots of vegetables and I always have, uh, yeah, in fact, just always have lots of chopped vegetables in the fridge and, you know, I can just end up gnawing on those all day. The other thing that I do is I always have lots of protein bars in my bag. Now, I'm certainly not suggesting that you should live on protein bars, but I do find that having protein bars is a, is a crutch for me to know that I don't need to go and look for other foods because I can just open up my bag and I've got some nice, you know, I mean, I, I really like grenade bars. I eat a lot of the peanut butter chocolate grenade bars. So, um, so I, can all, I always know that I've got some alternatives. But that being said, I do like to go and eat fast food. However, I always eat healthy fast food. So in Los Angeles, I can just go to Tender Greens. I can go even, even pretend you go to Chipotle. And I can have foods that on the face of it might not look particularly healthy. But in reality, I can actually make them count in my macros because I know exactly what's in these foods. When I go to tender greens, I know exactly what I'm eating when I have their salads and rice and, and all that good stuff. If I go to Chipotle, I know exactly what I'm eating in terms of macronutrient ratios so I can make it count. So, so first of all, you know, I, I, I always make sure I'm very conscious and very, and very aware of what I'm eating. I mean, let me give you a good example. Let's say you should be eating 2,000 calories a day and you go to Pizza Hut. Well, a Pizza Hut pizza can be like 1,500 calories. You know, so you're almost eating your daily calorie allowance in, in, one, in one intake. If your goals are really important to you, then there should be switches in there that are saying, you know, this just isn't right. However, if it was a slice of pizza, then the switches are saying, actually, I can eat that. And if I just have, you know, some vegetables or, you know, a little bit of extra protein, it's almost in keeping with what a meal of mine should look like. So, so that's, that's the preparation part. The accountability part is who are you making yourself accountable to? And perhaps, and this is one of the things with the groups that we've set up, the, 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 the Fitness Genes uh, Facebook groups, that you become accountable to people in the group because lots of people are getting great results. It's all about driving each other and working together to achieve those results. And ultimately, you're also accountable to me. So I hope, I hope that that sort of contributes to answering that question. Okay, uh, should we stop counting salads, spinach, cucumber, tomatoes, etc., and green veggies into our macros and cows in my fitness pal? Are these three types of foods? Very good question. And so what I would say is count them, but they will have such a minimal impact on the overall calories that even counting them won't matter overall. So still count them for completeness. 
I don't count them so much because ultimately I know that a big massive bowl might only account for 5% carbohydrate, five grams of carbohydrates. So, um, you know, but, but for the sake of getting into doing this properly, track them, count them, learn to understand them. And then long-term it won't become that important. Okay. Grace. Hello, Grace. How are you? One of your coaching tips for my results is to have pre-workout and post-workout meal. How can I do that without throwing off my recommended uh, three meals per day? Okay, so what you should think about doing there is dividing one of the meals. So for example, let's say pre-workout, let's say you have you know, three egg whites and a banana, or four egg whites and a banana, 15 grams of protein, 20 grams of carbohydrates. In your post-workout meal, you're gonna make up the remainder of the meal that's required as that one meal in your post-workout meal. So that's basically just splitting up a meal and, um, and that enables you to get the overall meal but into, it divided into two. I hope that, I hope that helps, Grace. Okay, Maria, what should you do if you go over one of your macros for the day? If you go over one of your macros for the day, don't worry too much. Strictly speaking, however much you go over, reduce it the following day by that amount, strictly speaking. However, but, but overall, it probably doesn't have that much of a significant effect. So don't worry too much if you're just slightly over. If you're massively over, definitely reduce it the following day. Bethany. Hey, Bethany. What are your guidelines for sodium? Okay. Um, I think think if you go to your coaching tips there is actually a recommendation for sodium and so whatever your recommendation is 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 kind of roughly what you should stick to so for most people it's probably going to be between 1.5 and 3 grams of sodium per day now the best way to manage sodium is to as much as possible avoid processed foods because processed foods have to add a lot of sodium to act as a preservative and that can have an effect on your gut bacteria as well. So just do your best to consume as few or as, as little processed food as possible, stick to whole food sources, and that will naturally control your sodium intake. If you need to add extra sodium into your diet, which I always have to add extra sodium because I generally don't consume a lot of processed foods, um, I would normally add Himalayan pink salts. It's, there's potentially a lot of health benefits to that. I hope that helps, Bethany. Aaron. Using it as a natural way to boost testosterone, is there something better? Great question. Best way to naturally boost testosterone is doing everything that you're doing. Working to get your body fat down, high intensity training. The other things that you can do, when you wake up in the morning, take some zinc, about 50 milligrams of zinc. And before you go to bed at night, about 200 milligrams of magnesium. And that coupled with exercise, coupled with your macro, getting your macronutrients right, that will have a positive effect overall on your testosterone. The other thing that you could do as well is add in fenugreek into some of your feet, into some of your foods. Fenugreek uh, potentially blocks one of the steps in the production of certain derivatives of testosterone. So that is something that you could also do as well. But 50 milligrams of zinc in the morning, 200 milligrams of magnesium at night, potentially some fenugreek, everything that you're doing at the moment, Aaron, and you'll get the improvements in your testosterone. Tony, if I know I'm going out on the weekend or away for the weekend, can I look at my macros and cows as a week instead of a day? Tony, yes, you can. But what I would say is don't do more, so don't have more than, or, or don't exceed your daily calorie intake by more than about 30%. So just be, just be careful that you don't go overboard with your overall calorie consumption because it will have negative effects if you go too far over. So you, you, you can certainly take it on a weekly basis, but on any given day, try not to exceed your overall calorie um, intake too much. Don't go more than, say, 30% over. And Sue, how would you adjust, if at all, one's intake if intermittently fasting? Okay, so intermittent fasting. I do intermittent fasting at least, well, two to, two to five days a week I intermittently fast. When I'm traveling a lot, I always do intermittent fasting because it helps me essentially control my calorie intake. And in terms of adjustment, you don't. Whatever your calorie requirements are, you have to get them into that feeding window. If it's eight hours, six hours, 10 hours, whatever it is, 
you have to get your calories into that eating window, which can be incredibly tough. And it can also be quite challenging on your mind when you're thinking the number of calories you're consuming in such a sport, short space of time, but it's incredibly important. Robin, how important is fiber? What is a good target consumption at any good foods that are high in fiber and low in calories? Excellent question. Fiber is critical, absolutely critical when it comes to weight loss. Uh, and I'll explain why. So first of all, digestive health is one of the most important components to managing your body composition. In fact, in your overall well-being. Your digestive system is generally referred to now as like the second brain because all the neurotransmitters are all produced there and you know obviously absorption of food is going on there. So we want to make sure that everything we're doing food-wise is supporting digestive health. And digestive health generally gets supported by foods that are very high in fiber and prebiotics and you know, etc. Prebiotics, things like zillium husk, is obviously essentially a fiber derivative. Um, so consuming high fiber foods drives gut health when you drive gut health you maximize the absorption of all the great nutrients maximize the excretion of all the rubbish it contributes to body composition so it's incredibly important also fiber is important for managing water so uh, the more fiber you eat the more water you will have to consume because if you don't the fiber will draw water out of your system and and it sounds crazy but if you have masses of fiber, it actually draws water out and it can actually make you constipated, for example, if you're not consuming enough water. So incredibly important for maintaining water balance, but you also, if you're consuming a lot of fiber, consume a lot of water as well. And another thing as well is that high fiber diets help control blood cholesterol because when your diet's high in fiber, it helps get rid of cholesterol from your gut. So another important reason why fiber is so important. In terms of calories, so high fiber foods, I mean, things like vegetables are obviously incredibly high in fiber. Fruits are high in fiber. High fiber carbohydrate sources, so for example, rice and you know, certain types of um, some like breads, Ezekiel breads, and you know, some of those sorts of things. If you account for them in your macros, then you know, it's great because you, then you're also getting great fiber sources as well. If you're taking prebiotics like zillium, for example, zillium husk, then I actually wouldn't even consider that from a calorie perspective because you're taking it as a supplement. So I hope that helps. Grace, is it good to take multivitamins, biotin and probiotics? I live in Alaska and absolutely have to take vitamin D, but do other supplements help too? Great question. Actually, Aaron, Aaron Purvis, your question about testosterone. The other thing is vitamin D3, very important two to 5,000 IU per day. Okay, great. So I live in Alaska, so you have to take vitamin D, but do other supplements help too? In terms of, so should you be taking probiotics? I wouldn't take probiotics. I would take prebiotics. So as I've just mentioned, zillium husk would be a great example of a prebiotic. You can take probiotics, but you, ha you have to take many, 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 bi many billions of bacteria in order to get their benefits. And also, if you're considering the requirement for pre and postbiotics, just make sure you're keeping processed food consumption low because that, that, that will have an effect of preserving your gut bacteria and gut health. Biotin and, and other B vitamins. Yes, B vitamins are important. So definitely taking B vitamin, um, B vitamin complexes is incredibly helpful. If you have the MTHFR gene mutation, and you'll know that by looking at your folate genes, you should also take methyl folate or methylated folate. And in fact, methylated folate and methylated B12, which you can sometimes buy them together. Should you take multivitamins? I think as a general rule, it's always a good idea to take a good multivitamin. So, so yes, it's certainly not going to do you any harm. And obviously, yeah, definitely make sure that you're taking your, your vitamin D, vitamin D3 as well. Okay, so are there any more questions or shall we draw this webinar to a close? And in the chat section, can you all just let me know your thoughts about this webinar? Have you found this useful? Have you found it valuable? 
have you found this a good way for us to have sort of interaction? And would you like me to do more of these? So if you could just quickly in the chat section, just, just let me know your thoughts there. That would be very much appreciated. Thank you, Grace. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Sue. Excellent. Brilliant. I certainly will. Thank you so much, Tony. Thank you, Bethany. Thank you, Leslie. Excellent. Thank you, Elizabeth. Wonderful. I've actually really enjoyed this, by the way, I've got to say. Uh, thanks, Aaron. Yeah, no, I'm glad I recorded it too. Yeah, I, so I've been very fortunate actually over the last sort of month or so because I've actually got to meet, you know, quite a few of the DNA squad. In fact, um, there's a few on the call at the moment. And, you know, one of the things I absolutely love, and it was the reason why I started all the groups as well, is I love interacting with you all. I like talking to you. I like getting to know you. I like understanding your problems because I want to be the person that can help solve them. I've always been one of these people that really enjoys, sol um, you know, I'm a solutions person. I'm a solutions person when it comes to biology and health. Always have been involved in fitness for 20 years. I was a doc clinical doctor for nine years, as well as my six years at medical school. So really, really, um, uh, you know, really enjoy this sort of stuff. So I'm glad you've all enjoyed it. Tori, uh, death fine, but Wi-Fi at the gym. Oh, okay. Of course, Tori, you're at the gym, aren't you? I'm actually about to go and do my, my workout today. I did, yes, I actually did today's workout yesterday and I'm doing yes, yesterday's workout today. But yeah, I'll, uh, I'll definitely think that through. Okay, everybody. So thank you so much. Really appreciate you all joining. Really appreciate the great questions you asked. And so great having you all part of the, of the Fitness Genes DNA squad. Thank you, Sue. And, you know, look forward to our next opportunity to talk. So have a great rest of your day. Have a great weekend. And I'll see you all soon. Cheerio. Bye.